Hello, great to be with you. This coming weekend is the 19th weekend after Pentecost, and we're going to spend a little bit of time today looking at the readings for that. Before we do that, let me remind you of a couple of things that we've said numerous times during the season of Pentecost and are definitely true and important for today. You might remember that in the season of Pentecost, it seems like we take turns either watching Jesus work miracles or we listen to him teach. Today is definitely a listen to him teach kind of day. I also want to remind you of something that we've said from the very beginning of the season of Pentecost, which is that at the beginning of the season of Pentecost, the emphasis is in large part on the growth of the church. By that, I mean the growth of the size of the church. So on that first Pentecost day, the number of people who believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior was pretty small. By the end of that first Pentecost day, the number had grown astronomically. Peter stands up and begins to preach, and 3,000 people are baptized into the name of of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the time the day ends. Huge growth. We also remember near the beginning of the season of Pentecost that those disciples, apostles, get sent out all over the place. Some stay in Jerusalem to teach and work alongside folks. Some go all over the world, and the name of Jesus begins to spread. What I mean by that is, at the beginning of the season, the growth that we see in Pentecost is numerical. The church is getting bigger. As we get closer to the end of the season of Pentecost, we're still talking about growth. But instead of the growth of the church, we now emphasize the growth of individual followers of Jesus. You and I grow in our understanding of who Jesus is. We also understand even better than we used to what God is calling us to do. As people who are set free, God now tells us what that freedom ought look like as a way to glorify him, as a way to love and serve our neighbor, and as a way to witness to the wonderful gift of grace that you and I have received in Jesus. And that's what we're going to hear today. We're going to hear a word from God that challenges us to grow in our understanding of his word and in our effort to live his word in front of others. I want you to be warned. It's a difficult word that Jesus speaks to us today. But because Jesus is our Lord and Savior, even when he speaks difficult words, we ought sit, listen, and after listening, learn and apply and change accordingly. You ready? All right. Our first reading is from Mark 10. It is Mark 10, 2 through 16. Pharisees came up, and in order to test Jesus, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. All right, I want to make a couple of notes about our gospel reading. Kind of seems like two separate scenes, but I don't know. 
there's a connection. Might not be a comparison, might be a contrast. First thing I want to note with you is something that I often try to remember when I'm reading, especially in the Gospels. Try to remember who's talking. I don't just mean Jesus here. What I mean is I want you to note with me who brings this question to Jesus. The reason why that's important is because we often know in the Gospels that Jesus responds sometimes differently based on who's bringing the question or who's bringing the problem. I don't mean to say that if one person with a struggle over conscience brought him this question that he'd answer differently, but he certainly does have a different attitude, take a different approach when it's the religious leaders who are, as Mark tells us, there not to really gain understanding. They're there in an effort to trick Jesus, to trap him in his words. And then it struck me how interesting it is that in the second scene, it's so unbelievably different. Instead of these fancy religious scholars who are supposedly steeped in knowledge about God and his word, but who come up to Jesus with vile intent. In the second scene, we have almost the polar opposite. Not knowledgeable religious leaders. Children. People who know next to nothing other than that. They would love to get close to Jesus. Parents are trying to usher these little kids up past the people who are trying to sit and listen quietly. Just a very, very contrasted moment here between those two groups. They aren't conspiring against Jesus in the second part. They just love him and want to get close. And I think that's cool. They approach him with joy. A couple things I want to mention about the difficult reading on divorce. Hope you didn't already click stop. One of the things that I want to note with you is the interesting idea that Jesus kind of lays out here that he says, hey, you know, Moses didn't give you this law about how you can just write a certificate and send her away because that's somehow ideal. He gave that to you because we live in a broken world and some things have to be allowable even if they are not ideally living up to what we'd want. Another thing I want to note with you is that something that's always been true in the history of being God's people is if there's one thing that we're good at, it's finding little loopholes that might help our conscience for a moment, but really aren't any better before God. So as I read this section, what I'm hearing Jesus do is describe here when the religious authorities bring it up to him, and then later when he's speaking with his disciples in private, reminding them how significantly different the way we live is in contrast with how God has designed relationships to be. Here's why that's important to me. Important to me because I think it's important for you today. I would not want you to hear this and think if you're divorced or have someone close to you who is that this is some extra harsh word from Jesus meant only for you. On the flip side, I wouldn't want you to hear this word from Jesus and you're thinking about your relationship being stable, thinking that he's not saying something that ought to bring some conviction to you. I don't think that's right. Because I think the truth is, is that this word from Jesus is probably even more necessary in our world today than it was 2,000 years ago, and applies to pretty much each and every one of us. The reason it does is because you and I now live in a world where relationships are so easily discarded. We now treat relationships as if they are just another commodity. And when we're bored with the one that we got, then you have to be a spouse, could be your friends, could be your coworkers, 
could be your fellow church members, as soon as this commodity isn't serving you the way you want it, you discard it and buy a new shiny object. We treat the central thing for us, relationships, as if they're just another shirt that we can buy when we're tired of the one that we got. It doesn't fit us right, doesn't suit our needs, doesn't feel like it's serving us. And I don't think that's good. The truth is that regardless of your or my marital status, the reality is, is that each and every one of us living today probably can realize that too often we have treated relationships as things that are about convenience for us, not about commitment from us. I also want to make sure that you hear me clearly for anyone out there who is divorced. This is a difficult section to sit through listening to Jesus speak. But I do think we should all remember that when Jesus speaks, there are moments when all of us are made to squirm. Not sure if you remember, this is in Matthew's gospel, not Mark's, but in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus talks about adultery, he says, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you, if you've ever had lust in your heart, then you've committed adultery. Uh, it takes that situation from being one where you hear Jesus talking and inside you're pointing fingers around the room to realizing you should be like, oh, no, no, hey, actually, you know what? Let's not point fingers today. That seems unnecessary. Same time Jesus said, hey, you've heard, don't murder. I'm telling you, anyone who's hated has murdered. Ouch. Sometimes Jesus brings the pain. And yet, there's an important value here. In addition to listening to God, show us how he sets the world to work in its most beauty. It also causes each one of us to realize the desperate need that we have for a forgiving Savior. And that leads us into our next section. This wonderful moment, let the little children come to be. It's actually one of the sections of the Bible that we read the most often in worship, so you know, because it's this section that we read as part of our baptismal liturgy. So whenever someone's being baptized, little baby or not, we read this section. It's an important thing, though, to think about because I think the reality is that sometimes when we hear this section, entering the kingdom of heaven like a child, that the first thing we do is we think about the pure, wholesome faith of children. And while that is sometimes true, I sometimes wish I could go back to the blissful ignorance of childhood. I don't think that's the primary point here. There might be some truth to it. Although, as you know, children are little sinners as well. Yes, I love them and I care about them. But they are born broken, just like you and me. When we're told to become like children to enter the kingdom, what that primarily means, certainly what they heard it mean in the first century, is that children are needy. Children are dependent. That's the core of who they are. And here's the thing. In the grand scheme of things, in our relationship before God our Father, we need to acknowledge first and foremost that that's what we are too, needy and dependent upon him. For us to relish in the gift of salvation, we have to acknowledge how desperate we are for that gift, how impossible it would be for us to arrive in that place on our own. And if we cannot find that humility inside of ourselves, the gift of grace, I'm not sure what it means. So, what I'm getting at here inside Mark 10 is that if the front part of this reading makes you uncomfortable to hear, it might, maybe it should. 
what it should do is create in us the kind of humility that truly cherishes the gift of grace from God to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. I also want to mention real quick, you know, like I said, I'm not all about the children are pure and holy kind of thing. They do have a blissful joy about them. That's what we see as they run up to Jesus. I do want to mention, though, that um, in addition to them being needy and dependent, there is a childlike sense of joy in Jesus that we see in kids maybe more often than in us. Time for us to drop some of the heavy burdens, some of the chips on our shoulder, some of the jadedness, and remember what it was like to celebrate knowing that God is always with you, maybe in a way that you haven't experienced since you were a kid. That's a good thing. I probably told this story before, but one time someone mentioned to me that uh, I ought look around the sanctuary and realize the stark difference between how kids crazily ran up to the children's message and how adults reverently walked up to the supper of our Lord. And they asked me if I could do something about that. So the next time we had communion at church, I said, adults, notice the difference between how we approach the table and how children run up to be a part of the children's message. Adults, time to get some joy back in your life. Hustle on up here, would you? Something to be learned from kids when we approach Jesus, our Savior. All right. I want to turn now to our epistle reading. And what I want to do today is I'll mention a couple things that are specific to the reading, but I want to mention some overarching things about the book because we're about to start a new book for our epistle readings. You might remember that we spent for a little while in the season of Pentecost some time inside the book of Ephesians. Then we spent some time inside the book of James. Now we're turning our attention for a while to the book of Hebrews. So I'm going to give you some notes on Hebrews in general. First, let me read our reading for this coming weekend. Hebrews 2, 1 through 13 goes like this. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, quote, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, quote, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, quote, I will put my trust in him. And again, quote, behold, I and the children God has given me. All right. Hebrews 2, 1 through 13. It's actually kind of a difficult reading, I'm not going to lie. I remember one time, I don't even remember what class this was for, going way back in my memory banks, but had to write a paper for a seminary and we could choose any topic that confused us or any section of the Bible that was difficult for us to read. And I remember writing about Hebrews 1 and 2. It's tough stuff. But I think there are a couple things in here that are important for us to know. Primary themes of the book of Hebrews. 
before I do that, let me mention a couple things just about the book of Hebrews in general, since we'll be in it for a little while. Like I said, we just came out of James, and now we're in Hebrews, which is interesting to me because those are two sort of unusual books in the New Testament. We read them as our epistle reading for church, but they're not regular epistles. Epistle, as you might remember, means a letter. And so many of the letters in the New Testament have so much in common from one to another. They have a to and a from and a style of being written. But James and Hebrews are a little bit different. I've read about the book of Hebrews that some believe it might be a collection of sermons. I've also read that about the book of James. So although they're unusual compared to the rest of the New Testament, they do have a bit in common there. The idea there would be something like this, that as persecution against the church grows in places like Jerusalem that people get spread all around the Greco-Roman world. We know that to be true. So some people have surmised, this is a totally a guess by the way, but it's a reasonable guess. Some people have guessed that maybe as people get spread around the world that someone's like, hey, you know what? Pastors had a great sermon series these last five weeks and Joe had to run off to Cappadocia Let's, uh, let's write those sermons down and send them out so that Joe can read those to the people that he gathers with. That might be true. Who knows? Won't know until we get to ask those clarifying questions at the gate of heaven, I guess, one day. Another thing that makes Hebrews unusual in the New Testament is that we have literally no clue who wrote it. There are other books in the New Testament where the author does not specifically name himself, but in those circumstances, we often know who the author is because church history has said it over and over again. You have people writing in the early second century about the gospel that Mark wrote, and they'll quote it, and you'll know exactly what we're talking about. But unlike a letter from Paul, doesn't start with, I, Mark, am writing this gospel. Hebrews doesn't start with, I, blank, am writing this letter. But like I said, with books like Mark, even though he doesn't name himself, we've got a really, really, really strong sense of that being the author. But Hebrews is totally anonymous. In the early, early church, people would send the letter of Hebrews around with the letters of Paul, kind of bound it all in one book and sent it around. But there's even a tip that they did not think Paul wrote it. The tip is that it was in a goofy order. They kind of had all Paul's letters together and then Hebrews, just like it is in our Bibles today. If they really thought Paul wrote it, they would have put it earlier because they tended to put the letters not in chronological order, not in alphabetical order, but in order of which book was the longest. So Philemon's the last letter of Paul, not because it's the last one he wrote, but because it's the shortest. So had they thought Paul wrote Hebrews, they would have shoved it somewhere else. So who wrote it? Who knows? I think Luther's the one who famously said, I think it's Apollos. Why did he think that? Probably no reason at all. But because someone asked, he felt like giving an answer, and that's the one he gave. If I had to lay a wager down, I don't think the sports books are covering this, what the odds would be, I'm not sure anyhow. If I had to guess, I would guess the author of Hebrews is Barnabas. Do I have any good reason to believe that? No, not much. Other than that, there are moments in the book of Hebrews where it sounds like the kind of stuff that Paul would say, but it's different enough that it seems pretty clear that it came from a different writer, different voice. So I like Barnabas because he traveled with Paul, knew Paul, Heard Paul teach and preach over and over again. What's that worth? Not a doggone thing. Let's get back to the text of God's holy word, shall we? Yeah, let's do. All right. So a couple things that are very true in the book of Hebrews that we begin to hear here in Hebrews 2 are these. One, the importance of faith. There's a beautiful, beautiful an interesting thing that gets said here in verse 8. I'll reread the end of verse 8. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, 
he, that is the Father, left nothing outside his, that is Jesus's control. So I'll say it again more smoothly. The Father left nothing outside the Son's control. Let me start over and read it again. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, the Father left nothing outside the Son's control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Boy, isn't that true? But it's important too. And it's almost the definition of faith. Faith is trusting in things that we do not yet see. So here's what the Bible teaches us, that God's in control. But if you look outside your window, nah, don't look outside your window. The world's probably perfect outside your window. Turn on the TV. Nah, don't do that. Don't hurt yourself. If you spend any time hearing about the news of the world, it seems like the world is always spiraling out of control. And it's really difficult for us to look around and see that evidence and believe that God's in control. The author of Hebrews tells us, yeah, that's right. Everything is in subjection to Jesus. At present, we do not yet see that. So I don't know why that sounds like a word of comfort to me. It's describing the situation we're in, but I guess it's comforting to me to know that this author way back then reminds us that's the nature of faith. To be able to look around and say, boy, this is just such a mess. Chaos. Seems like no one's in control. And yet, to have faith that God is in control and everything is subject in subjection to Jesus. Another thing we get here in Hebrews 2 that's a pretty common theme of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is better than. Better than what? Yeah, you name it. Fill in the blank however you want. The next bold print section of my Bible says that Jesus is better than Moses, greater than Moses. Here, what are we hearing? Greater than angels. That's the kind of stuff the Hebrews talks about. Remember the tabernacle? Jesus is better than that. Remember the sacrificial system? Jesus is better. Heard about how awesome angels are? Yep, Jesus is better. Moses, big dog. Biggest dog in the Old Testament, Jesus. Bigger dog. That's what the book of Hebrews does. Walks through all these mighty moments, all these mighty folks that God worked through and says, as great as they were, and they were great, Jesus is better. So those two themes run through the book of Hebrews, hinted at here in chapter 2, faith, the assurance of things hoped for, certainty in things that we believe even though we cannot yet see, faith, and Jesus, greater than everything you've seen yet, greater than anything you'll ever see, until we see him face to face in glory, we'll know true greatness for the first time. All right, cool reading. I like it. It's interesting. And uh, we'll be in Hebrews for a while, so I wanted to lay out those Hebrews ideas for you. Okay, now let's take a quick peek at our Old Testament reading. Our Old Testament reading takes us all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 2. So this is early, early on. I'm going to read to you from Genesis 2, verses 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last 
bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. All right, a couple quick comments. As you heard here in Genesis 2, this is one of the very, very small handful of readings where we get to see a world unstained by sin, unbroken by death. Here we are in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Now, as you know, for this lectionary Bible study, I don't look at these readings solely to wonder what they mean. I also wonder why they were chosen for this day. Sometimes that's easy. The Old Testament and the Gospel are most of the time meant to go together, whether it's by theme. This one's more obvious than that even. Quote, this is what Jesus is quoting. When the religious leaders bring him a question, this is what Jesus is pointing to. And here is what Jesus points at. Helps make this clear. The law that you have from Moses is to adjust and provide guidance for life in a sinful world. But our real aim as God's people, not just to follow those rules, our real aim as God's people should be to provide a glimpse of life, of what it was like before the stain of sin entered creation. Maybe you've heard me say this before, but a number of years ago, probably eight years ago, one of the closing prayers from our wedding ceremony it just captured my mind. I've thought about it a lot since, and I've preached on it a lot since. At a lot of weddings, this is what I preach on. One of the closing prayers after this couple has been made husband and wife, one of the closing prayers is about a blessing upon our homes, asking God to bless all of our homes. And it says things like, that our homes would be a fortress for the tempted, a resting place for the weary, and then, the one I like best, a foretaste of our eternal home with you. Isn't that a great prayer? A prayer that God would so bless our homes that they would be a little glimpse in advance of our future home with God. That, I think, is a lovely, lovely mission and something that all of us can embrace. Whether we live in a house that's so full of people and noise or whether we live by ourselves, that our homes would be a foretaste of our future home with God. That they would be a witness to others of the beauty of life lived as God's people. So a couple things I think are interesting. One thing I think is interesting about this Genesis 2 reading, after Eve is brought to Adam, you hear these words, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Here's what's interesting to me about that. Adam and Eve, they got no fathers, no mothers. You know? So, I think it's just kind of an interesting look at how Moses writes, records. Those words would have meant nothing to Adam and Eve in that moment. But they mean a ton to God's people as they read about it later. Is that Moses jumping in as someone to say, hey, look, this is how you and I apply it to our lives. Kind of interesting. I also want to note with you something that I think is super interesting but I really only just started thinking about it today. I don't have a fully formed idea of what I mean quite yet by this. Here's what I'm getting at. The beginning of the reading. Here's what it said the Lord God said. Quote, It is not good that the man should be alone. Now, if you know any men, 
You know that's true. You leave a man alone, what are you going to get? Disaster, chaos, a mess, injuries, hospital bills, all sorts of crazy stuff can happen to a man when he's alone. But here's the thing. This is being spoken about Adam who lives in paradise, in perfection. Here's what you ought to have heard when the Lord's voice jumped out in Genesis 2 here. When he said, it is not good, you should remember that so far in the book of Genesis, most of the time that God speaks, do you remember what he said? This is good. Day one, good. Two, good. Three, good. Four, good. On and on. This is good, God said over and over. But then he looks down at poor Adam, living in perfection. And he says, it's not good that he's alone. Here's what I'm thinking about. And I wonder if you'd think about it too. Kind of challenges our idea, I think, a little bit of perfection, that good could be added to it. So even though Adam lives currently a perfect existence, outside of having a human relationship, it's not as good as it could have been. God adds good to something that was already perfect. That just interests me. It made me think. One of the things it made me think about although I'm going far afield from the book of Genesis here, one of the things that made me think about is that sometimes when you and I think about life after death, one of the struggles we have about believing in a bodily resurrection one day off in the future is that when we think about our loved ones who have gone before us in the faith, we want to believe that they have everything already perfect. Well, guess what? They do. But then we wonder... If they already live in bliss and perfection with Jesus, how could there be something more added on later, bodily resurrection? And it just struck me that as we ask those questions about the future, that going all the way back to the beginning of God's story with his people, we see another example, perfection already being, and yet God adding good to it. Just found that interesting. Maybe you will too. Hey, before I go, let's close the prayer. Lord, as always, we give thanks to you for the gift of this day, for the opportunity to dive into your word, to study, to learn, to think, to pray. We pray, as always, Lord, that this knowledge that you guide us toward by the power of your spirit wouldn't be knowledge that puffs us up, but would be shaped into love that builds up, and love that would be shared with another. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. See you next time.